welcome to Two Pages of Mystery. I'm your host, Rob Steele. As I start off every podcast, I want to make sure that you are aware that the purpose of this show is to get your story published. And by published, I mean, yes, I am going to almost immediately do an ebook version. I will turn it into an audiobook for this podcast. Also, and this isn't out yet, but it is coming soon, there will be a hard copy book that can have your story in it. It will be available from Amazon, from Barnes & Noble, from anywhere you happen to find books. Right now, all the stories are available on the website, twopagesofmystery.com. But as soon as that book comes out, the stories that are in the book will only be available in the book. So if you want to download them now, go right ahead. But if you want to get involved in Two Pages of Mystery, the book, Volume 2, send in your stories now. This is the part where you might get paid for your story. We'd also like to thank iTunes, the Google Play Store, the Happy Hour Network, and Learn Out Loud for passing the show along. So without any further ado, today's story, a rare baseball card is stolen and its previous owner murdered. But as Lieutenant Wright knows, when in doubt, follow the stolen goods. Sit back and give a listen to It's in the Cards. <laughs> I got called out to August Acres. Again. This time there's a murder to solve. Neighbors called 911 and said there was what they called a ruckus going on next door and possibly a gunshot. Officer Scott Waters was the first on the scene and he called in the shooting of Don L. Coles. The name sounded familiar, but it wasn't until I got to the scene that I recognized him. He was in the news recently big sports fan that collected baseball cards and recently found a famous card with some kind of error on it. When I say error, the news said it was an obscenity printed on the card that somehow made it past the proofreaders. Once it was discovered, the company allegedly recalled everything so they could fix it, but of course some of the error cards escaped. They're supposed to be selling like hotcakes on the market right now, too. Not that this card is going to do Mr. Coles much good right now. Officer Waters taped off the house, and the CSIs and Dr. Young beat me to the scene. Silly me, tried to have lunch today. That's what I get. A murder on the opposite side of town. Anyway, Doc Young says the cause of death is a rather obvious gunshot wound to the head, but he'll be able to tell more after the autopsy. CSI said they found the bullet embedded in the wall behind him. Large caliber. Not much in the way of gunshot residue on the victim, so the shooter was likely at least six feet away. That would put him on the other side of the room, but not an impossible shot. CSIs also said there was no obvious sign of the famous card. Now, CSI Mark Davis told me he saw the story on the card, too, and that Coles kept it into display, but that display is now empty. Although he also said he found several hundred boxes of cards in the other room. And yes, he'd go through all of the looking. But it was unlikely Coles would put such a rare card in a box like that. I asked him who would be the local expert on cards like this and who would want them and deal for them. He points me at a local sports card shop called The Four Corners. The owner was Richard Henderson. I'd like to go by Ricky, my favorite player growing up because both of his talent and the name. But I don't out of respect. I respect the game too much for that. What can I do for you today? I explained the situation and Henderson looks shocked. He was in here just the other day. He's in here all the time. Well, was, I guess. He opened the pack that had that special card right about where you're standing. I was happy for him. He has the worst luck in pulling cards. Bought a lot of them but always seemed to get crap cards. He once pulled an autographed card from a pack, and you know who it was? Greg Jeffries. You know who Greg Jeffries is? I shook my head. Don't feel bad. Most of the people who come in here don't know who he is either. That was Darnell's luck. I asked if he knew if anyone was overly interested in the card. Henderson says there was this guy in last week with a funny accent and a nice suit looking for both card and Coles. Says he remembers him because he doesn't get many suits in the store. Or accents, for that matter. 
I still have his card around here somewhere, he said, rummaging around behind the counter. I notice a touch of irony that a man who sells sports cards for a living and has many organized and displayed so nicely throughout his store would misplace a business card so easily. After a few moments, he produces the business card of Glenn Hubbard, lawyer. Something strikes me a bit odd about the card, though. It's perforated. Like it was a business card you'd buy and print yourself. A bit low rent for a lawyer. I thank Mr. Henderson for his time and head back to the station. I asked Detective Manny Vasquez to give this Mr. Hubbard a call and have him come in to answer some questions. Shortly, a rather smallish man with an enormous red bushy beard is in interrogation room one. But not without some difficulty. I confer with Manny before entering the room. This is Mr. Craig Lefferts. He says he represents Mr. Hubbard, and while he understands English, he doesn't speak it. Great. I asked Manny if we have a German translator, and he surprises me by saying, I speak it. Let's go. He smiles at me as we enter the room. We take our seats across from Mr. Lefferts. Mr. Lefferts, we need to speak with Mr. Hubbard. Your arrival here without him is just made him a prime suspect in our case. Leffert sneers and with a dismissive wave says, Hunden, bitter. I turn to Manny for a translation, but Manny is trying hard not to laugh. What do you say, Manny? Well, directly translated, he said, Bitch, please. Then Manny turns to Mr. Leffert. Haven't he sick de basti Google uber sets in lassen? Manny told me later he'd asked if Lefferts looked that up on Google Translate. Lefferts just humphed at us. Wir sollen in hin die Psychologie Klinik für die Bitterung in ein Rektal Eckerschlung nehmen. Manny looked at me for a second and started to stand, nodding that I should follow. Manny had just said we should put Lefferts in a mental hospital for observation and give him a rectal exam. Manny hit it on the head. This guy was not German. And he realized we knew he wasn't. All right, all right, you got me. He's always got to outdo me on everything. How did Darnell get you guys to do this? I mean, come on, this is good, but usually we don't go this far. I fixed him with a glare that made him sit considerably straighter and look a bit fearful. You think this is some kind of joke, isn't it? <sighs> I hate practical jokers. You got the Darnell pot. The thing is, Mr. Coles is dead, and right now, you're our prime suspect. Seriously? Hang on a minute. I just got back in town this morning. I mean, yeah, I left that Glenn Hubbard card at the shop as a joke. He was a second baseman with the Braves back in the 80s. People say I look like him. It was uh, just a joke. I, I was playing on the way out of town. I, I went there from the airport. Honest, um, are, are, are you sure he's a dead? Lefferts. As it turned out, that was his name, broke down in tears. I just wasn't sure if the tears were for his friend or because we caught him. We let him stew in the interrogation room while I checked on his alibi. Sure enough, he was out of town. Passport confirmed it. Lefferts wasn't even in the country until a few hours ago. Technically, he was back in time, but he'd really have to hurry to pull it off. So what now? Officer Faye should be back soon with a report on the neighbors. Manny said he'd follow up with Mr. Henderson at the card shop to see if anything else came to mind. This left me... where? I guess I'll follow the card. I checked with CSI Davis and he said he'd barely scratched the surface on Cole's card collection. I asked him what the best websites to sell sports memorabilia were so I could look for the card online. A few moments later, I had a list of sites but only one had the elusive card for sale. And the seller was in Canada. A bit far for a commute. Or was it? Just because someone says they're somewhere online doesn't mean that's where they really are. The person selling it was allegedly named Wade Blylevin. It sounded a bit fishy to me, so I did some digging and found out that if you took the players in the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, Blylevin and Wade Boggs, they're next to each other alphabetically. This was an alias. But how to track him? Or her? I can't be sexist about this. 
For authenticity, the person selling the card would at least have to mail the card from Canada. Does that mean a Canadian did this? Came all the way here for a card? That doesn't make sense. It's not going for that much. So who are we looking for? What is the motive here? Perhaps the card has nothing to do with it. A Cincinnati red herring? I run a check on his financials. Cole paid most of his bills on time. A bit late on the cell phone, but hey, who isn't these days? No problem with his rent. Good income from his position as an electrician with Keebler Reese, a local but reputable electric firm. No obvious gambling debts. I notice Officer Tim Fayer's return from his canvassing the neighborhood, and my delight in seeing him quickly turns to disappointment since there was nothing to turn up. The neighbors say Cole's kept to himself. Several saw the story on him on the news, but didn't realize it was the neighbor who found the card. Maybe that was a lead. I was about to call the reporter who broke the story, personal favorite, Alma McCarty, when I hear her voice coming from the television in the break room. I wander in to make sure she isn't live. It probably would be awkward to interrupt a live broadcast with a phone call. Strangely, I was right, though. Alma did have a break in the case, but not in the way I was thinking. She was on TV interviewing Don Tia, a top-ranking official at the card company that made the erroneous card. He was saying how happy he was that he was able to acquire the card. And that was the case breaker for me. The press hadn't gotten wind that Coles was dead yet. And here was his high muckety-muck with my evidence on television. A quick call to a station revealed her location as the Pinnacle Hotel downtown on Pacific Avenue, thankfully not far from the station. I arrived shortly after the interview finished. I smile a greeting to Miss McCarty and show my badge and introduce myself to Mr. Tier. He seemed a bit taken aback when I mentioned that he should come with me to the station for a round of questioning. He claimed he'd acquired the card in a perfectly legal transaction, and he didn't know anything about Mr. Cole's demise. I had him come in anyway. After several hours of interrogation, I learned several things about the baseball card business, and this card in particular. Mr. Tier says the card's obscenity was not exactly a printing error. The foulness in question was actually written on the base of the bat featured in the card, most of the editing process concerned the player, and neither his uniform or equipment had much attention paid to them. But since Mr. Tier is directly responsible for the printing process, he says it's his ass on the line and he wants to make sure all the erroneously distributed cards are reclaimed, and there is enough of a stain on the company with a recent but unrelated memorabilia fiasco. I also learned that Mr. Tier was conducting interviews all morning in relation to the acquisition of the card, and that his interview with Miss McCarty was the last of them. So he has an alibi, too. My last question for Mr. Teal was the cost of the card. Mr. Cole seemed quite taken with it in his interview, and I suspected the price was high. Mr. Teal says the price of the card was $5,000 and a box of cards a week for life across the entire sports line. He said he delivered a case of cards as a show of good faith. I asked how that broke down numerically. Cards, packs, boxes, cases. He says 12 cards per pack, 36 packs per box, and 8 boxes per case. That's a lot of cards. That also led me back to CSI Davis. I asked if there was any evidence of this case of cards. Davis said that while there were a number of cards from Tia's company, there wasn't evidence of that many of any from a particular set. Now I have another suspect. About half an hour later, Richard Henderson is in my interrogation room one, sweating profusely. As I enter the interrogation room, Henderson yells, I didn't mean to do it. I look at my watch. About two seconds. That's the quickest confession I've ever gotten. We'd made a deal. That pack he'd opened was on the house. I felt bad for him since he bought a box and got nothing of significance out of it. I gave him that pack with the card, and we decided we'd use that to, as a way to get publicity for the shop, and any proceeds would be split between us. 
but he decided he wanted to keep the cards all to himself. Henderson was almost in tears at this point. Do you know how much money it costs to run a card shop? Some of these packs cost $100. I gotta buy a box at least to keep up with the market, and even then, most of these collectors don't care for shop and just buy single cards online. I'm losing my shirt here. I wouldn't worry about your shirt anymore, Mr. Henderson. The state should be providing those for you for quite a while. I hope you enjoyed the story. If you have any comments, questions, or want to submit your own story, contact me through the website, twopagesofmystery.com, or just email me at 2pom at steel42.com. I've been Rob Steele, and you've been listening to Two Pages of Mystery. So until next time, keep them guessing. <laughs>